man, I look forward to Tuesday nights like no other. It is Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, actually 7.01 Central Time. So y'all know that that is another awesome conversations with Commodores. Tell me you don't recognize number 44. He still looks like he could play. Not Former at all. captain. Not at picking all. Off, picking off all kind of SEC top talent from, the, from linebacker. Lamont Turner, how you doing, bud? So good to see you. Doing great, Bernard. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And, guys, that's why I look forward to Tuesday nights is because we can chop it up. It doesn't matter. Oh, who's the first guy here tonight? Who's the first? Who, who's, Lamont, who's the first guy here with us tonight? I have no idea. I can't see the participants, but uh, if it's somebody from my class, that would be uh, cool. But, hey, anybody that actually shows up is grateful for me. I have no idea. OJF. Oh, OJF. Franklin. Yeah. Franklin, absolutely. Like, Battleground like, Academy in the house. Like we were talking, a, OJ's been a uh, fixture in my life before, after, and uh, during Vanderbilt, for sure. Absolutely. We've got OJ, uh, AJ McGrew is with us. And Lamont, as folks roll in, I'll let you know who's who's there. No worries. Yeah. Before we get back to the late 90s, when you're picking off Quincy Carter and Tim Couch and all those other knuckleheads, share with what's going on in your current life. Where are you? What are you doing? What, what keeps you energized every day? Maybe tell us about your family, whatever you want to share. Yeah. You mentioned family, and that is my top priority. I have two daughters. I have a wife. Yuberki. She's from the Dominican Republic and we're raising two five-year-old twin girls. Their birthday will be Saturday. So they'll be six. And again, that's like the tail wagging the dog. It feels like at times. And uh, that being said, I had to make a, an adjustment to, as far as occupationally and transition. So I could be available post COVID to mm -hmm. live a lifestyle that I want to. So I'm currently coaching, consulting, I'm getting my certification through a program called IPET, which is the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching. So I'm doing that. And there's a couple other opportunities that are still in the infancy stages. I it may be premature to talk about that, but primarily coaching and coaching, right? I mean, coaching and consulting, yeah. Well, very good and happy early birthday to your daughters. That's awesome. I appreciate that. As the father of, of two daughters who are a little older than yours, just hang on. Just hang on. <laughs> hey, like I said, this tail is wagging me pretty strong, so I'm trying to hold on. So we'll see. You know, they, they say the the days are long, but the years are fast. So I know you'll take it in. I know you'll take it in. These five uh, and six years have gone by quicker than I ever would have imagined. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. I want to say good evening to Dwayne Jones, who is usually the he's usually with us and he's He's forgotten more than you and I will ever remember about our days back there. But thank you, D DJ, for hanging in with us. But Lamont, let's talk about growing up in Franklin. Yeah. Was it a good place to grow up as a kid in the 80s and 90s? Or was it a place that you just clearly don't, uh, don't have that many great memories? What, what was it for you? Which way? Yeah, so it was just down home, just southern country folk, if you will. Loved it. It was home for me because... Everywhere I went, uh, Franklin was a lot smaller back then. So everyone knew everyone. You would go to the post office, all the kids your age, you played with them in the youth league sports, football, basketball, and baseball. Mm -hmm. It was a very tight knit community, um, very community and civic focus. So uh, we were engaged in church, a lot of same values. And, you know, so nowadays it's kind of changed. It's, you have a bunch of migrants coming in from all over the country mm -hmm. and the world really. Yeah. And so the whole demographic has changed. And so uh, one of the things I like about growing up in Franklin, um, especially when I went to BGA, I was able to preserve my culture mm -hmm. uh, with all those different activities that I told you about. But yeah. still, when I went to BGA, I kind of got more exposure to a more affluent lifestyle, if you will. But mm -hmm. um, and I also got challenged a little bit more academically as well. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. Now, I'm a fifth grader, sixth grader growing up in, in Franklin, and I want to play youth sports. I want to go play some some backyard ball with my buddies on the weekends. Where am I going? Where's the, the places to play ball? I would say um, 
Jim Warren, Jim Warren Park still, you know, so they still um, not only play all three sports, basketball and football, as far as I'm concerned, they even actually have, um, I guess, roller skating and all that there as well, too, now. So that's mm -hmm. a new sport that wasn't around when I was coming up. But every now and then you can still drive through the neighborhoods, at least the ones that I go through. You still can mm -hmm. see some pickup balls. Um, I don't know where the primary ones are, but. Um, Franklin still has remnants of what I consider to be old school Franklin. If you go to the right neighborhood, it'll be lively yeah. as well, too. You know, even in my hometown, I, I went through there it was about a year ago, my old neighborhood, and I had been through there a few times over the years, but I was sad to see that what were all of the woods back in my day when you could ride your bike through there and do all that fun stuff, it's all, it's all neighborhoods. So I didn't know if that had become maybe oh. your neighborhood or your area. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, my dad, before he passed, he talked about how Franklin and Nashville have met each other, but even yeah. the deep wood, wooded portion or the more, I um, guess I would call country parts of Franklin mm -hmm. keeps getting more and more gentrified now. Like we used to have old Carter's Creek Pike. Mm -hmm. We used to actually just take rides down and, and things like that. And so now developers have come in and they're putting mm -hmm. like, multi-million dollar resort areas mm -hmm. to where we used to go out and go hunting and fishing and all that took away all yeah. those good stuff so it's, it's harder and harder to find and keep land and, ha and to preserve God's country and that's why we take family trips to the DR the Dominican Republic and let sure. our our kids experience mother nature to its finest. Um, what about hanging out at the Optimist Center OJ uh, Fleming? Yeah so Ironically, I live about a block away from the old Optimus Center. And I live like in the heart of what used to be considered the, I guess, the hooded area of Franklin, which is not hood in a bad way, but seriously like the neighborhood where mm -hmm. all of those players at the park mm -hmm. used to live. Um, some It was a combination of just normal residential homes, a lot of um, public housing as well too. And so some of that is still there, but definitely less of it. But Optimus Center, we used to walk right up the street and it was a central place where the community used to come together to watch and support kids as they were coming up through the sports. And so uh, that's gone now. And ironically, organizations like the one I'm, I volunteer for, like Civil War Battlefield Preservation, I'm a board member of, of that, Franklin's charge now and so part of their mission is to acquire land to preserve the story what they perceive to be the story of Franklin to be which is Civil War based and so ironically I'm on that and I got on that board to partly to um, I guess preserve all of the different aspects of Franklin's full story which is more than the Civil War and this. And it's a lot of that stuff is is what OJ is talking about. A lot of community pillars helped make Franklin what it was. And sadly, like you were talking about, a lot of that is more and more challenging to preserve. So yeah. Well, it's all all in the name of progress, whatever that may be. But but speaking of a fellow who got good news this week, Jason Smith says to tell you what's up. Oh. Is that uh yeah, right, I forgot his nickname but that they had before. To me, he's just nothing but Jason Smith, the big old teddy bear, uh, who is an actual inspiration with his kidney um, transplanting that whole journey there. So he's yeah. all I, I think they used to call him. I don't want to say I think the older heads used to call him running man or something fast. But he was a he was a big man, quick on his feet for sure. But Jason Smith, hustle man, hustle, hustle man. man. I knew. Yeah, I knew. It was some, I knew it was something moving fast somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so definitely. Well, speaking moving fast and getting places, you get to Battleground Academy, always has a rich history with sports, and you get on Vanderbilt and other schools' radars during high school. Did you always know you wanted to play on the next level in college? Did you know you always wanted to play football? And how did you end up just 30 miles up the road? Great questions. So for me, football, it ended up becoming a passion my senior year. 
Mm-hmm. I reached the point in my, the end of my junior year. Um, and I, I was asking myself the question, like, what am I going uh, to do? So I didn't have a clear vision of always wanting to play college football. My brother went to Vanderbilt on a full ride academic scholarship my freshman year. And so I just thought that that pathway might naturally develop for me. But when I got closer to it, I was like, hey, you know what? I got to have a plan to go somewhere after I graduate. And so I never will forget the visual image of seeing OJ uh, Fleming and Jason Donovan sign their scholarships. And that's when it became most tangible to me that, hey, it, these guys that you played with the past couple of years, if they can do it, and then when Matt McAfee, our quarterback, did it, I said, hey, you know what, this is this might be the easiest next step for me. And when I got a letter from Joe Paterno from Penn State, and uh, I was like, you know, just randomly, I wasn't expecting it. Um, so when I started getting letters keep coming in, I was like, okay, senior year, let's, let's make a run for it. And so I was a former lineman, got moved my senior year, full-fledged to be fullback. And because I had to compete with the running backs, that enhanced my agility skills. And now all of a sudden, that linebacker attention that I was getting is really has amplified because of my footwork and agility uh, by working on footwork drills and stuff like that with the running backs. And so that really took it off to a next level. And so for me, as far as right up the street, I always knew I wanted my parents to be engaged uh, in the experience because I wouldn't be there without them. My dad, my senior year at BGA, he was on the sidelines holding the chains. And so uh, because he had positioned me to uh, actually have this opportunity, you know, and I was, I guess, if you will, I was a homebody from mentality standpoint. I didn't I didn't really branch out until like I graduated from Vandy, but that's a whole nother conversation. We'll get on that. But my dad, I wanted him and my mom to experience that. And so it was either, I was going to be local um, always. It was either Vandy or Tennessee. And when Randy Sanders and and, uh, Cutcliffe uh, informed me that they were going to only go with um, Raynock Thomas and uh, whatnot, I think that was the only linebacker they signed. And so I just, it was an easy or a decision for me, but I had always had an affinity for Vanderbilt with my brother going there when I, when he was cutting the hairs of the, the twins, the graph and we, the uh, Kenny Simons of the world, um, I think as well. Uh, just so watching those in the big, I think was it a uh, big, big chick. What was his name? Um, the lineman, I think um, they called him big chick, I think, but with him being, with that being said, uh, my brother, Manley. Yeah, James Manley. So my brother used to cut their hair. And also, too, the running back, too, number uh, 23, light-skinned guy. Somebody knows his name. I think his name was. But to see all these guys, I was like, I'm, I'm right here touching, you know, and seeing them, dapping them up. I was like, you know, this could be a reality. And sure enough, it was. So mm-hmm. I say, you know what, this is an easier transition. And sure enough, it was one of the best decisions, even still today, making Bandy my home. And so, yeah. I'm great. How often would you visit campus or how well did you know the campus and the fellas before you committed? Yeah. So, um, I knew the players more so than I kept up with the, the team as much, Mm -hmm. uh, as ironic as it may sound, I wasn't a big football follower except for like Saturday mornings watching, but I just, I, I, I didn't become a student of the game until like once I got to really, really know the players. So I knew the, them as people first because that's how my brother knew them as. And so I thought it was cool that they were just so big. So, um, and so I would come up probably about once every month with my brother. My brother didn't like us coming up invading in his space, right? So, yeah. and yeah. so I would come up if I was lucky once a month. Mm-hmm. And then when he started having these frat parties, <clears throat> and things like that and he started <clears throat> talking about all the stuff that they do there I was like yeah so once I did that I, I just when I got hooked to actually wanting to become a Vanderbilt study a student there so yeah I was gonna say by your senior I mean seniors in high school regardless of the place sports or not they're never home <clears throat> they're always right. gone they're at right. one campus or they're, part, they're they're visiting whatever they're doing but I truly believe for the athletes who want to play at the next level, 
their senior year, it goes by so fast and you are truly never home, whether you take all your visits, official or unofficial, whatever it is, but with your brother being, I don't know, 30 minutes away, 45 minutes away, whatever the traffic flow was, I could see you up there quite a bit. Now, <laughs> here's my question. When you're coming up there and you're having this awesome uh, senior year, how many of these guys are already on the team talking to you about joining them on the team? Well, OJ would come down every now and then to watch a, vet, uh, a BGA game. And mm -hmm. so I got very familiar with uh, Jim Anguiano mm -hmm. and, and John Bradley, mm -hmm. almost to where they're like became like very, uh, you know, just uh, acquainted friends, you know. And so I was like, I had developed a relationship just by their acquaintance with OJ and coming down. And so, sure. yeah, so I had actually got forward to looking um, forward to meeting those um, them as well. And then with, um, with, I never will forget our senior year, Alfonso Harvey was at the end of the end zone and who, who cannot, um, who can forget Alfonso's uh, stature if you will, and how he kind of walks with mm -hmm. kind of like this little swag, swaggy limp. And uh, that being said, I never will forget his image. And from that point on, I was like, yeah, you know, I mean, he represented what I thought to what a college football player should look like. And so and just he, that big, and he, big old head that, that I also have as well. <laughs> and he, and he truly, he truly does. He, he like so many Commodores just, I guess define in my image what a what a football college student athlete is. Now I want to step away from the field for just a minute. We're going to get into college in just a second. I want to talk about your interests away from football. Did you have any? Did you have passions? Did you have other things that really occupied? I don't know. Did you play uh, a musical instrument? Did you do crossword puzzles? Did you have things? that really interest you as a, as a kid and a young adult in high school, and maybe you've carried them on since, but were yeah. there things that really got your, your interest away from sports? Yeah. <clears throat> so like I spoke about with Franklin um, coming up in our community, it was very uh, civic and community focused. So growing up, I had a more, um, I guess, very traditional, evangelical Southern experience, if you were coming up in the church. So very strict upbringing. And so for me, again, I kind of stay closer to that. And to a lot of extent that helped kind of keep me grounded in who I was. But at the same time, I didn't get a chance to explore because I was more concerned about following the line that I should follow for other reasons external to me. And so... <clears throat> Uh, that being said, like I said, I, I feel like I didn't fully get a chance to explore, you know, who I was. I'm, I'm a lot more well-rounded these days, I would say, as far as um, based off my own um, interpretation, if you will, of what, um, you know, how religion and spirituality fits in my life. So that was an aspect of me as well. I think also uh, just you know, video games, right? That was the era where you're coming off Atari, I think you, and then going into Nintendo and then to, to all that. And so, you know, with John Madden just passing, Madden was a big deal for us on campus. Uh, we played that when we were not um, in either in class or on the field or whatnot. So just that whole locker room camaraderie that was there in the locker room that it oftentimes extended into the dorm rooms okay. with other players so we played a lot of video games as well um i also had a um interest in learning other cultures because at bga i'll you know my pathway to bga was always uh i guess one of a different pathway so i was always intrigued of different cultures because that's what that was a part of my experience so i got a chance to meet a lot of students um, from India, from Brazil, um, some 
other stuff like that. So I really kind of, I engaged in a lot of conversations like that, as well as expanding, you know, not a lot or as much as I wish I had at the time, but I got a chance to expand my, my network, if you will, with other certain uh, cultures there. So, so that was always something of interest to me. I also too, um, I was a mentor for James Beard. Um, I think the cousin of Santonio Beard who just passed, there was a Bethlehem center Mm -hmm. um where Robert Beer was very he came he became instrumental during my time there um so I gave back to the community through him so I got a chance to build a good relationship gave me a lot more perspective there um most of the times I would kind of go back home and give back with my mom who was a Head Start teacher which Mm -hmm. some of my teammates came down as well too a few times to where we gave back and read books to the kids and things like that so I bet she uh, loved that. Oh yeah, they they the kids really loved it, and yeah. you know at the time, you know you you don't really realize the impact that it's having, and so um, I'm glad I did it. Um, you know, and especially like I said, not only it being from my hometown community, but with my mom herself. So I did that as well. And besides that, just family. Uh, you know, like I said, that's part of the reason why I stayed at Bandy to be close to family, and uh, I would just go down um, pretty much off season, you know, maybe twice a month or whatnot, just to kind of go see my, my mom and dad. And and we had family gatherings at times as well too. a lot of my, my uncles and cousins. And so that was pretty much what made um, the, the bulk of my extracurricular activity. And I know we mentioned before, before we came on, you asked me if I was Greek, you know, I think again, social life um, off the yard or off Vanderbilt's campus yeah. uh, was limited to me. And again, I didn't, I didn't even, like I said, get a, get that true um, taste to go across the tracks or any track, if you will, to uh, off campus until, like I said, around about my senior year when I graduated early and I had more time mm-hmm. uh, after that and so but besides that I was there tired and exhausted in my dorm room (laughs) you know unless I missed it I think there was one other extracurricular activity that you haven't mentioned but you certainly I suspect made it pretty cool for other student athletes other males boys to be in the choir at BG oh wow how did you get that one Oh, I just have spies and people. <laughs> Maybe OJ might have mentioned it just now in the comments. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, never so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I did. I, I, uh, yeah, the uh, starting running back and starting, full, I was a starting fullback and the starting running back as well, too. We were both uh, in the choir our senior year, and they found that to be very ironic and because of that, we didn't have a band at the time, small college prep school. Yeah. The choir director was very adamant about getting us some type of replica of a band out there. And mm-hmm. so she got her little organ out there and uh, so a few instruments. And and we had the closest thing to a band that we could have at BGA. <laughs> oh, those are good memories. Guys, I'm talking with LT, number 44, Lamont Turner. And we're just talking about some BGA days and and I want to I want to transition to the gridiron in college and and what was your welcome to the SEC? Welcome to college football. You're no longer the big fish in a small pond in Franklin. Now you're a real small fish in a big old competitive SEC. What was your coming to to college party or a, event, if you will, or moment that you can recall? Yeah, so I would say on the practice field at camp, I would say it's Jason Tom Tomachet. Um, mm-hmm. He was a tight end. I think he went to FRA. And, you know, when you're that senior, you got these new freshmen coming in. <laughs> you know, they almost make it a point sometimes, like you said, hey, welcome to college football. Yeah. And for me, it was when, he kind of shot his hand so quick. And so he was strong. Mm-hmm. And um, I think he might've, he might've drove me to the ground. I'm not for sure, but the impact of it and how quick he hit it. And, and I felt his presence like all up in my, mm-hmm. my upperness, you know, just like, I just felt like I lost c- complete control. 
that was the moment that I was like, wow. And, and obviously seeing the twins out there at the time, I didn't really engage with the twins at the time. I, I, I was fortunate enough to kind of not get locked up like I did with Jason, but Jason Tomachek, yeah. uh yeah he he I, I never will forget that was like okay you know um because he wasn't uh, just domineeringly big if you will mm-hmm. but he actually again was so strong and Take just me. like he was a man he was a man yeah. that's like when we got there yeah a lot of people I perceived to be men hey, who had old man strength like the Star Wars of the world and and all that those were just they were grown men and uh and the last thing you want to do is underestimate them. But as far as on the field, I would say, like we said, the first game of my college career was Notre Dame, like Lou Holtz, you know, looking at Mark Edwards, the, the fullback at the time, yeah. like, you know, and just seeing like all these figures that you watched a year or two before on the TV. It's like, yeah. hey, this is this is it, you know, national TV, all of that. So that's when I, I was like, OK, hey, it's yeah. Welcome to college football. Well, you've got – you had one of my teammates was one of your coaches, Chris Gaines. Yeah. And me playing on the scout team, I had the um, – I wouldn't say it was the pleasure, but I had the obligation <laughs> of running the scout team with Chris nice. 10 feet straight over center looking me in the eyes. And you know Chris, as intense as they get. Yeah. But he's also as nice a guy as, as, as you'll ever find. What yeah. was it like being coached by Chris? And how high, and I mean this with love, Chris, how high did that voice get when he's trying to make a point on something you may or may not have done what he wanted you to do? Yeah, so um, for me, uh, Chris, as you said, was intense. And so he didn't raise his voice that high often. And I think at times, like, you know, he makes that face and his lips kind of, you know, when, yeah, he said, yeah, if, if you didn't, LT or whatever, you yeah. know, just something. So so that's about as loud as he kind of got. But what I remember mostly is the intense conversation, the slow down. Like, I, for example, one time, you know, I was late walking in for a workout about a minute late. I said, hey, coach, I said, on my, on my watch, um, you know, I'm on time, you know. <laughs> and he was like, he said, well, you're on my time, mm-hmm. LT. And um, a matter of fact, another linebacker who – I think that might have been their first or second time, or whatever. I never will forget. He was explaining to him. He said, "Because we're LBs, we're not going to run the stadium once, but we're going to run it twice because mm-hmm. we set the tempo." And again, that's the type of intensity. And yeah. if you know stadiums, and if you're a big thigh LB like me, like that's kind of like my kryptonite. And I think it was Jason uh, or uh, it was it um, Jamie Duncan's as well too, like. That's one thing that you do not want Jamie Duncan to run. He'll backpedal, hit you and all that, but you don't want him to run the uh, stadium, just like I didn't want to run the stadium. Mm-hmm. But besides that, Chris was just a slow, intense, very just um, very intentional coach, you know, and, and a passionate, like you say, because he's caring. And I think at the end of the day, that's what I remember about Coach, uh, his love and passion for the game and his care for his players. Well, Lamont, you – I had the, the privilege this time of being on the sidelines. We played Tulane in the Superdome in 87. And Chris Gain had 37 tackles that night. Wow. Who in the world ever has 37 tackles in one evening? Yeah. It, it, it's got to be not only a Vanderbilt record, it's probably an SEC record and maybe even a national contention uh, for tackles in, in one evening. Right. But let's 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 transition. Let's go to that. We believe to be the first night nationally televised home game was your first college game. Absolutely. 1996, Notre Dame, Lou Holtz. You were just we were just getting into that. Do you remember how you felt leading up to that game? Was it? I don't know. T- take us there if you can remember that. And did you get to play in the game? What was all that like? If you if you can bring back some memories. Absolutely. So I was a true freshman and I was playing, meaning I wasn't red shirted. And so I was going to be on special teams. And everybody was calling me locally and asking, hey, are you going to be are you going to be on 
on the field you're going to play and all this and that. And I was like, yeah, I'm a, on, I think, kickoff, kickoff return, maybe or whatnot. So, yeah, I'll be out there. And so that was the anticipation from my level and standpoint. Um, and just, again, how big of a game and the building up of that game uh, for that night. Like you said, I didn't even know that fact until you posted it here in the community or the page that that was Vanderbilt's first televised night game. I didn't know that at the time. But it was a big deal. It was sold out. It was packed all over. Students were hyped. Everybody was, it was hype. You know, it was just like, that's, it's what you want to have as an incoming mm-hmm. college football freshman anywhere across the campus. It was um, pandemonium. And so, and the fact that the, I guess, uh, unspokenly, uh, the expectations were low, which is why, especially when we should have in some people's eyes, maybe won that game, yeah. um, you know? Uh, and I mean, it went down to the wire, you know, Ty Yoda and the long bomb and the catch and all. I mean, we were right there. And so for me, um, it was a confidence builder, not only in the program, but my teammates, as far as, you know, um, Vanderbilt is right there with mm-hmm. any and every program who's there, you know? And so, So that did wonders for me, like, you know, just uh, as a player, uh, getting that uh, experience and exposure to see what it can and should and feel should feel like on college game day. Did did playing in that game, even though you were limited to special teams, did that give you some confidence? Oh, yeah. Did it show you, man, I can compete. These are some this one of the best teams in America. Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, um, it was a kickoff or a kickoff return. Forget which one. But they saw my name on on the TV, like Turner, and like they saw me kind of getting like almost in a in a pushing match or a fight, not a fighting match, but you know, in a tussle yeah. uh, with the opposing player. And they were like, "Yeah, like they see you out there." And so that first engagement, if you will, mm-hmm. on a collegiate level, um, you know, I kind of got that first hit out, and I was like, "Okay, let's go, let's do it." You know, you, hey, you did one, go out there and do it again, yeah. and. Yeah, so confidence booster for real. Yeah, absolutely. I've talked frequently on this about the mindsets of an athlete while you're during your time period of playing. And for any athlete, really any person, whatever their endeavors, confidence in what you're doing, your abilities, regardless of who your opponent or whatever your your obstacle is, that confidence goes such a, a long way. And as an athlete, when you lose that confidence, for example, if you're a quarterback and you just can't make those throws, or you're a running back and you 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 fumble, kickers, wide right, wide left, it takes a while to build back that confidence. So my question, I, I want you to talk about a little bit of the mindset of playing linebacker, the little bit of the mindset of why confidence was important then and how you've brought it forward into adulthood. Yeah, so confidence at a linebacker position, you have to, you're like that tweener person. You have to have the tenacity of the hog that's up front Mm -hmm. and the finesse of the, and the divaness, if you will, of the DBs and the safeties. You have to get back in pursuit and cover a a, uh, running back out in the flats or a receiver coming in for a dig route or whatnot. And so there's so much going on um, potentially in your head. And so you have to, as far as mindset, you have to have a certain level of, of focus. You have to have a process of deducting the possibilities of what may and may not happen um, in the formation. You have to get repetition, right? And so, so that, one of the biggest challenges is with the confidence is if you don't get enough mental reps, enough physical reps, you'll get out there and you second guess. And that's one of the worst things you can do at a linebacker position is get caught flat footed by second guessing, um, you know, and so the more repetitions you, you can get, the more confidence. So when you talk about the transfer of, you know, life skills, if you will, Again, mentally, you know, what does, do you, how do you envision um, this play to play out 
you know, and, or in life, just so creating the vision and actually getting the mental reps, kind of walking through it. And then if, if you can, try to get as many uh, practice reps doing that out before the actual real um, time comes. Like if you have a presentation that you have to do for corporate, for a customer or whatnot, you know, create what the problem is, it is you're gonna address the solution, how are you gonna actually address it, things like that, and actually play it out in your head before you rehearse it and you rehearse it mm-hmm. until it becomes more and more conf- confident. And are you gonna make mistakes? Absolutely you are. And so that mindset of a linebacker is, uh, Coach Norm Park used to always have a saying, every bull has been ridden and every rider has been bucked. So are you going to make some plays? Absolutely, you're going to make some plays. Are you going to miss some plays? Absolutely. Are you going to get ran over, you know, and trucked by somebody? It's kind of funny that you you asked that question before. And now, as far as welcome to college football, I never will forget my, you know, on the field experience, if you will, um, Taylor. You know, um, Fred Taylor for uh, Florida. That was a time where as a sophomore, I got in for like a play. And he, number 21, ran straight over me. Hey, um, I think I think I think I tripped him up some type of way or so, at least slowed him down for somebody else to come and do it. But he actually, yeah, he ran me over. Uh, but like I said, I think I think I got in his way, but I think he might have kept going. But that was like Hello, Fred. And I think I went in there for like a play or so, but that was my first linebacker experience. But the intensity was and focus, um, you know, you got to you got to bring that and that and that, all of that is part of that intensity, like the, the stamina to actually endure that uh, with the ankle tweaks and all that and kind of get back up with it. Well, I was going to say that's oh, you, you answered it beautifully that it, it, it doesn't matter what position you play. It doesn't matter what sport we're talking about. It the, just playing team sports teaches us so much about life and how we take those experiences. And as we get into adulthood and into our professions, and then we're teaching it to our, our children or hope that they, they follow some of our lessons or at least listen a little bit. <laughs> but guys, I'm talking with Lamont Turner, number 44 LT, some calling Pete back in the neighborhood. I want to welcome Darren Rothenberg. Thank you, Darren, for joining us tonight. And I want to stay on the field a little bit because there's some names in here that you've got the best of. And I don't know if you guys ever used to yell Oski or some other word similar. I don't want that's what I want you to tell me that in the heat of battle, you make an interception. Do you even have the, the mindset to whatever your code word on defense might be, or did you guys even do that? But guys, we're talking about the number one draft pick in the NFL. Number 44 took him pretty good a couple of times. Tim Couch, he got Quincy Carter for a, took it to the house. But talk about that, about interceptions, because it's such a change in flow of the game. Take us into one of those. Lamont? Yeah, so I would say uh, Kentucky and um, Georgia were two different experiences, if you will, for me. To answer your question, we did have the word OSCE. Uh, and so throughout the week, um, I recall when I made those picks in practice before I made them in a the game, I do recall our defense saying OSCE. And so, but was I mentally thinking about that during the games of that? I did not, but it was kind of like, you talk about the flow of it. There's a point that was my flip, if you will, of understanding the zone coverage, if you will, understanding like, instead of like when somebody crosses my -hmm. face, I don't chase him. Parker used to always talking about, hey, let him go, let him go. And look, look for the other person coming to replace him because the offense is going to, they can only have so many people in different zones of the field, if you will. Yeah. And so I, I really started to grasp that. And I, you know, after a while I was watching C Hall and, and Jeff Coat when, you know, when I was early on starting out, I would actually be turning my head and looking for that dig route to come in as I progressed in my junior year. And that's when I got the flip, like I can start filling this stuff out yeah. by, 
a combination of filling it out and also looking at the QB's head. And so I was like in a zone, like sometimes, you know, you match up well as a, either, either a personnel player to a certain particular offense or personnel. And so for me, Kentucky, that was an ideal situation. That's why um, Parker referred to me as having swivel hips. And, um, and because of that, for that particular game and that particular scheme, um, he moved me from middle or a weak side back to the middle, put me in the middle of the field. And so in pass coverage, I was the Mike and uh, Jamie and uh, Winborn and uh, Stewart were on the sides. And, and ironically, um, Dennis Harrison said that I almost had three, which I did. So I just had a real good feel for that. But Damn for man. Georgia specifically, I pretty much called out that I was going to get that pick of that route, that slant route that Georgia count, that, that they did because I called it out and I like picked it off like two times there. So when you talk about the mentality and the yeah. envisioning and seeing that, um, I didn't uh, process it that it was an OSCE. Um, and what's interesting, I what um, the year before I had dropped a pass in Tennessee of T. Martin and Woody, he always let me know that I dropped that pass. And so I had caught so many jug passes just for that one opportunity. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. and when it happened, I was like, um, thank God that Winborn and all them came to clean up those who were chasing me or whatever. Um, but, you know, I, I just took off and ran and I, you know, and I didn't know if anybody was there behind me and I just ended up diving in the end zone. Number one, because I felt like, man, if I could just get like within the 10 yard line or whatever, I'm going to dive and, and get it over the line. But yeah, that's, I mean, I envisioned the, the second one, but besides that, it was, you know, just playing the game. And fortunately it worked yeah. out. So you're, what you're not telling me is that you, you stiff arm Quincy Carter on your way to the zone or outran him to the, the strike. No, I did not run him. I, I, I got there. I crawled, I dove over it before anyone else was able to trip me up. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I didn't know who all was behind me or how close it was, but I, I did uh, just do it though. And so I just did that. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great play. And I'm grateful for my teammates. I think Nate Morrow and, and Jamie Winborn made a couple of key, key blocks. I, I think so. That's what they tell me. I didn't even really uh, see it all happen. So. We, need, we need to get that video. We need to find that. But what about the defensive talent in the mid to late 90s on defense, the athleticism? So many of those teammates of yours went on to, uh, to play in the pros or had a taste in the pros. Winborn. How long did Jamie play pro ball? Ten years? Something like that, yeah. He's been so, on the show, and we had an awesome, awesome conversation. He's been through so much, and I'm so proud of him and what he's doing. But uh, the talent at that time under Coach Woody and, and uh, Dauhauer a little bit, phenomenal levels of defensive athleticism. Absolutely. And, you know, coming into it, I didn't realize it um, – you know, I was a single di digit player, so I was number six in BGA. And at the time, all I could remember is Stucky because he was a, Eric. I think his name was Stucky. He was a linebacker. And and believe it or not, uh, you know, he was, I guess, one of the least active ones. But you had Jamie Duncan, Carlton Hall, Anthony Jordan, all of which many would consider to be like all Americans, uh, depending on your um standard if you will but I think despite Jamie Duncan getting most of the notoriety C. Hall I think he might have pushed him or either made as many tackles as Jamie Duncan that year and so to be in the film room with coach Norman Parker at times he would just stop the tape and he said guys I want you to know that you're playing with greatness and so and then after they all leave then you got you know Winborn coming in and, and not to mention the classmates that I had so my whole class, we were like, again, we were stuck in a crunch. It was like, you know, you got all Americans going out, you got all Americans coming in and coach Norm Parker called us up there one day and showed us the film of Winborn. And he's like, Hey guys, I'm just going to turn this uh, film on for about three plays. And after the third play, he cut it off. And I think the first one, he was like, whatever. And like, once we saw the helmet go one, 
one way of the running back and we saw Winborn get up yeah. and you know do his little thing he was like yeah. hey you know there's not going to be enough room for for all of us and fortunately I was just you know I was the one out of my class of a great group of linebackers who um got the most playing time but just filled with talent from my whole time there from my class to Jamie Duncan um uh, you know because my class had AJ McGrew Jason Smith and um uh, Chris mm-hmm. Cook even Deke uh Deke uh, he's a walk-on. He was a baller too. So, just filled with talent. I think they were like the number one defense my freshman and maybe uh, sophomore year as well too. And and I can't believe sometimes that we only won two games with each of those yeah. teams being having the number one and number two defense like in the country or something like that. So. You know, when when you're competing in the SEC, number one program or number one conference. Um, let's talk a little bit about get to your senior year. You're chosen as a, as a captain in, in 99. And that's, that's high praise. That's, that's, that's the coaches, that's your teammates. That's everyone in the program respects what you do, respects what you're about. What did it mean to you to be, be voted one of the captains that year? You know, when Coach Woody pulled me up there and um, in his office, he said, hey, Lamont, um, I want you to know what your teammates think about you. And um, he told me that, you know, it's pretty much a consensus that you're going to be one of the, the captains. And I was like, um, I really didn't know uh, what to say at the time. Because uh, it really, like, I processed it probably about 24 hours after the fact, but everything that he told me as far as what this meant for my team, it's like, hey, what we need you to do is set an example, um, you know, show up every day and, you know, just and, and kind of set the tempo, if you will. And so understanding what it meant for me is I was just grateful, but understanding also to the dynamics and the reality of it. Like when I was at BGA, I was the big dog. Right. And so Understanding that you had Winborn, for instance, who, you know, has a lot of talent and understanding his per- personality style, you know, how do I as a leader uh, maintain my status and make it all fit in together? And how do you co-create a space and and do all that? So for me, um, and also to my team, my, my other co-captains, that's what I really take pride in as well, too. And so uh, these were the things that were on my mind. Okay, what's going to be my role? How am I going to play it out? Yeah. And, uh, and and how are we going to set the, you know, the bar for this particular year? And while my year is there, um, my, my fellow captains and my seniors, we were able to have the most successful by winning terms um, yeah. while we were there. We almost went bowling a game away, right? And so, yeah. and so for me, it was um, just a grateful honor. I mean, I, it means more to me as time goes on. And so I just, you know, so yeah. Well, you know, not only did your teammates respect what you were about, but clearly the coaching staff, Coach Woody fostered that environment so much so Am I correct in saying that, that Coach Woody and some of the coaches attended your dad's retirement party? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Coach, that was a big deal because, like I said, my dad was my uh, biggest fan since high school, right? Oh, even before that, obviously. But um, for him to make the effort out of his schedule to attend my dad's retirement party, that meant a lot for him. And, um And the coaching staff and Coach Norman Parker, for him to build a relationship that he did with my dad and my family as well, too. Um, So that trust and respect has has been there from start to finish. And I'm glad that Coach Woody, um, you know, was able to show that love and respect there, too, as well. So it was mutual for sure. Yeah, absolutely. One of the beautiful things about team sports, whether it's high school, college, whatever level, pros, the relationships that you build and then you maintain. And I suspect even now, if you get together with some of your buddies from back in the day, and you might not have seen them for quite a while, 
maybe not since college. I have a feeling there might be some fun stories or, or people that you all have told these stories for years. And a lot of it may not even be true anymore, or at least in your mind's eye. Yes, actually, yeah, more extenuated as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there may be a, a teammate made you laugh back in the day or a funny thing that happened in the, the locker room, where, wherever it may be. But, and I know this to be with my guys, you could say one person's name or a key phrase and everybody is just dying laughing because it takes you back to that time and place. And you're laughing because I know you're thinking of something, but doesn't it, it takes you back to such an innocent time. Right. Not that right now is not, but now you're an adult. Now you got kids, a job, a mortgage, et cetera. Oh my but, back, God. but back then it was, you didn't know how free and carefree oh. and, and things, you know? Absolutely. Doesn't it take you back? Doesn't it? Your time on campus is my point. Your time on campus is just a brief part of your life. Mm. But the memories and the relationships for the next 40, 50 years are priceless. Absolutely. I mean, we're talking about family, and, and hearing you bring up that perspective makes me also bring up within my class, and particularly early, we learn how fragile and how short life is yeah. with Cal Gullet Horn. We witness essentially him pass before our eyes. That was a very traumatic experience. Um, I'm to this day friends, Facebook friends for sure. And, and we've uh, exchanged uh, communication multiple times with Jenny Gullerhorn, which is Cal's uh, sister. But for us to be there, in our dormitory and have to break out a window to help our classmate in his last moments of transition, seeing that um, and sharing that experience let us know just how fragile life is. And again, to your point about just the bonds that you make over time. And, you know, those guys pretty much are my family. So like you said, so, Obviously, I have some that I speak to on a more frequent basis that I speak to like, you know, multiple times throughout the week. Yeah. And then there's some, like you said, whenever I see them, it's nothing but love. Um, you know, I mean, with having kids and responsibilities, there's less time, but there's always that BU black and gold love that uh, will never, ever go away. Um, how, many group, how many group texts are you in with former teammates? Yeah, exactly. So it all depends. Uh and, and thank God that you've kind of synchronized it. So we have the whole black and gold family here with this Facebook group, right? So, uh, but yeah, I'm in multiple different um, threads, you know? I mean, I got some with uh, just two here and then I got a few here. And uh, But all of that being said, um, that common bond, yeah. there's nothing like that uh, with that back, black and gold. And um, they'll, they'll never take that away. Well, one, one last thing I want to, want to bring up i understand part of the lamont turner le legendary and legacy that you established at bga and on your time at, at vanderbilt and beyond is your unbelievable ability to sleep anywhere anytime any place i know somebody was gonna and well that's well that's oj right so yeah I, absolutely i cannot you need to look in the comments i cannot disclose who it is but from one sleeper to another, I'm telling you, I could be in mid conversation, but when it's time to sleep, I'm done. I tell you what, <laughs> to make that even more official, I did get diagnosed with, I guess, sleep apnea after the fact. Oh, so, oh wow! So, yeah, so I did a sleep study mm -hmm. um, later on. So I, there, there was some issue going on. I guess there were some lifestyle changes that I needed to make, if you will. <laughs> yeah. So I made those lifestyle changes. And so I don't sleep with a mask mm -hmm. or anything anymore. So, but yeah, there were some issues going on, especially when you're stretching it thin, like we were talking about, you know, um, yeah. Hey, burning it at both ends of the candles multiple times and, yeah. and, and stretching yourself on the field and in the classroom. Hey, let's just say I left it all out there, you know? So, um, you can never say you didn't my friend. <laughs> Before we conclude, I got a couple of my teammates just joined in. 
Greg Smith, number 79, out of Chicago. Tom Fitz, number seven, pure hands, out of the Cincinnati area. Hey, guys, thank you. We're joining, talking almost at the end of our conversation with Lamont Turner. All right, Lamont, I, got, I, need, I need a prediction from you. We got the, the Super Bowl coming up a couple of days. Either of your teams, you, you root for either of those teams? You got any players you really like? What are you, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of Jalen Ramsey only because one of my customers knows him directly. However, I lived in Cincinnati for a year, mm -hmm. very uh, developmental year, very memorable year of my manhood development. And mm -hmm. so I'm very acquainted with Cincinnati. I love them. And I love Joe Burrow being from LSU. He straight up balled out in that SEC championship game. So I'm kind of leaning towards Cincinnati. You know, that's, uh, you know, I mean, because I just thought that whoever gets Joe Burrow, once he gets in the lead, I knew he was going to be, uh, you know, just a player. And so, uh, you know, so I got a lot of confidence in in him, but Jalen uh, Ramsey, um, he's a local kid. And, and so I just want to see a great game because these past few playoffs games, they've like been the best in history. So I just don't, I want them to, yeah, I just want to. I just want to keep that going. I mean, the best. Yeah. Well, you and and Mattress, Mattress Mac, who has like a four or five million dollar bet on the Bengals, the guy out of Houston is famous for this. But Lamont, I want to thank you, bud. It's been my pleasure getting to learn a little bit of your journey and your experiences. I truly enjoyed our conversation tonight. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My my pleasure. I enjoyed it, guys. We've got we've got. Commodore's lined up. We're going to keep on keeping on doing this. And in a couple of weeks, I think it's the 22 weeks, maybe I can't remember exactly. We're going to have a roundtable discussion about name, image, and likeness. And I think you're going to find this to be unique because we've got perspectives on parents who currently have kids about to go into college. I've got college coach, a, a high school coach. We're going to have four or five former Commodores. Well, you're always a Commodore, former players who are going to bring, I think it's going to be a good one, but Lamont, thank you, bud. Stick around after I sign off. I got something to tell you, but you guys continue to be safe. Keep coming back on Tuesday nights. Anchor down. Anchor down.